Michelle Graves, your host on The Power of Money, and I'm honored to have you as a part of my world in this coming segment. With The Power of Money, as you know, we are interested in three things. First, that you get the necessary education so that you and your family will have the information to do well in these difficult times. The second thing I'm interested in is for you to be empowered to prosper. I want only the best for you, but you can't get that if you don't have the education and then the drive to make it happen. And the final thing, and perhaps the most important thing, is that you be energized. Because life is more than a journey. Life is about living. And so I want you to learn these things and to be empowered and encouraged and energized. I'm Michelle Gray. Now here we go. And welcome to today's segment of The Power of Money. I'm your host, Michelle Grace, affectionately known for the last 40 years as the Money Lady. And as always, it's my honor and distinct pleasure to be able to be a part of your lives for the next hour. This is uninterrupted public service information to help you and your family to thrive in these very challenging times. And I don't have to say it because many people have already said it. We are living in incredible times, times that our grandparents, great-grandparents, will tell you that are much worse than even the Great Depression that they had to undergo, mainly because it's so much stuff coming at all of us at the same time. Never in history, and I do mean in recorded history, have we seen the madness and the craziness. Can you imagine nine foot of snow in Los Angeles? Really? and just horrible weather conditions, seasons out of order, um, people out of order, and then don't talk about COVID, which despite what anyone may say, even though we're not talking about it, COVID is still on the loose. Even though the media is minimizing it, COVID is still on the loose. It has taken over 1 million people's lives in this country. I don't think anyone has been unaffected by it, and it continues to ravage in the form of long hauling with people that cannot seem to get rid of this thing, period. So we're dealing with that. We're also dealing with economic uh, disparities, economic chaos in all parts of the world. Uh, we're dealing with the disease and sickness. And in the midst of all of this, one begins to wonder, what the heck is going on? Is it the apocalypse that the book of Revelations has foretold of? Uh, we talk about wars and rumors of wars, but with Russia officially in Ukraine blowing up everything for now more than a year, can you believe that? Well, I shouldn't say more than, yes, it is more than a year. Uh, we are in the month of March at the point of this telecast. So Russia is still over there blowing up everything determined to uh, um, be the great giant that it feels it is. And needless to say, let's not miss China. Let's not miss China because China is a force to be reckoned with. I ought to know I lived over there back in the day. And I'll tell all of you, frankly, I'm not going back. I saw all I needed to see in mainland China. And 20 years ago even, uh, they were adamant that Taiwan was going to be taken back, even if it had to be annihilated. And I'm telling you, it's looking more and more like it might be annihilated. They're not interested in doing anything other than proving a point. So we've got all of these things going on all around us all around us. And the United States, uh, like it or not, is knee deep uh, in a lot of stuff, some that we should be in, some that we should not be in. You cannot run the world. You cannot be in all places at all times uh, without cre creating peril in your own country, which is exactly what is happening in the United States. We continue to deal with a trillion dollar debt problem and 
facing the debt ceiling again, uh, with Congress having to make some harsh and hard decisions. There's not a lot of wiggle room because debt will suck the life out of a country. It simply will, and there's no difference between this debt we're trying to serve and all of the things that we're trying to manage at the same time with this endless printing press, money, money, money. But if money is nothing but worthless trees, then how do you survive? That's something to think about. Okay, our, our government currency is not backed by anything. We went off the gold standard with Dick Nixon. And I personally, I think it was terrible. I think we need to be under, this is my opinion, don't go crazy. I feel we need to be on a gold standard because it keeps us accountable. Right now we're under the, uh, in God we trust, and that's a question mark because I don't know how many people in this country even believe in God at this point in time, in whatever form you want to choose. They don't believe in anything. They believe that they are the God. And therefore I tell folks, go with it, run with it, let's see how far it gets you, and send me a postcard when you get there. Please don't forget to send the money lady a postcard. But I say all this in great, 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 great sorrow. I say all of this. Please do not dismiss uh, what I'm saying. This is quite painful for me to talk about. I am a citizen of the United States of America. I am an African-American woman. Uh, whose family descends, obviously, from Africa, but more specifically uh, from uh, Nigeria. It's what I, from what I understand, Ibus, which are uh, one of the tribes in Africa. Um, and so, you know, I got that going. And then I look at, here we are where we cannot even provide for our own people. We are so busily monitoring everybody else that our own citizenry are going down the tube, period. Not just people of African descent, but people from everywhere. White people are going down in flames. Latino and other people, the Chinese, I think, are hanging on. But the reality is that we are not able to give uh, full attention to our own own people in terms of trying to create a living wage and, and trying to ensure that they have decent housing and that they have food. And food, of course, is essential for every, nothing happens if you're hungry, nothing. Everything comes to a screeching halt. Now, we know the three things that keep everybody happy and that's under Maslow's hierarchy of needs. For those of you that are psychologists or want to Google it, read what this brilliant psychologist said years ago, that you have to have food, you have to have clothing, and you have to have shelter. Those are the three essentials. Now, let's talk about them because the first thing, housing. If you are poor in America, I don't know how you're making it because the housing costs in America have just gone through the roof. Even in rural areas, the housing costs have gone through the roof because the rich have bought second homes in these rural communities and have raised the prices so that the people that live out there can't even afford to live decently. That's a problem. I was reading an article about Jackson Hole, Wyoming, a beautiful area of the country, and was rich people lived there, but regular working people lived there too, and working people can't afford to live there, even doctors and people that are more affluent. They can't because the price of everything has been pushed up by the rich getting second homes. Is that fair? Is that right? Does it matter? That's something to ask yourself. Does everybody have the right to decent and fair housing in this country as a part of the three necessities in the United States of America? Or should a person be forced to pay twelve to $1,500 a month to live in a one-bedroom apartment? And how are seniors supposed to manage that? And for so many of us, including myself, who are quickly moving into that category, I am a senior, and frankly, I find $1,500 a month to pay for a one-bedroom apartment to be obscene. 
obscene, like really, I find it obscene. And who can do this? Okay, who can do this? And yet this is becoming the standard, not just in your big cities, but also in your rural communities as well. And so we're being challenged by housing. If you think I'm kidding about the crisis in housing, you need to drop by any hotel in the United States at night and you will see cars parked in the lot with humans in it sleeping because they have no place to go. Everything is in that car, including their children. Now, I'm sorry, but I don't believe the United States is a banana republic, and I don't believe that people should have to live like that. They stay in the hotel lot because it's lighted, it's safe, and believe it or not, if they're smart, they can slip in the hotel in the morning and wash themselves up in the restroom area. That, to me, is just deplorable, obscene, unacceptable, okay? We're worried about other countries, and, and, and I'm not excusing that. We're a compassionate country, historically. We've helped other people. But I'm talking about us right here, right now, okay? So we're now compromised with housing. That's a major. That causes stress in the community. Why? Because I don't care who you are, all of us know people who are poor. And if you're so rich that you don't know, then maybe you need to get your chauffeur to give you a ride into some of the communities so that you can see out of your own eyes what is happening. But you know what's happening. You got good eyes and you can see. You know that people cannot live on $20 an hour with rent being over 50% of their pre-tax, not after tax, because it's worse, pre-tax earnings. So we've got this rent thing. And then the second thing we're dealing with is clothing. Well, clothing today, thanks to the Chinese, is not an issue. Clothing is abundant, plentiful. I didn't say it was high quality, what do you want? But clothing is available. And I encourage people to donate, to give. There are uh, organizations that do not resell your clothing, but make it available to the poor and to children. And so clothing is not so much an issue over here. It's an issue in other countries about clothing. But over here, it does not appear to be an issue. Um, people that don't have a lot of income can get vouchers, typically from the Catholic social services and those kind of nonprofits, to, and even churches have thrift stores. Although I'm deeply offended that you would put a price tag on your clothing because it was donated. Okay, so which means that you're going to profit off of the free will giving of your supporters. I, I don't like that. I don't like that if people gave. And of course, net your operating expenses. We all understand it costs money to run any kind of thrift store. But do you have the right to charge way over your operating expenses to make profit? That is offensive. Okay, should a dress cost $13? Really? Really? A used dress? A used pair of pants? Should they shoes? Should they? And you say, well, you know, everybody's entitled to make a living. Then you need to remove the tag thrift and just leave the name up for what it is, which is clothing and used store. That tells the truth. Don't talk about it as if it is a, a charitable organization because it's not. But I don't want to get into that because I'm showing my personal uh, attitude this time as I look at many of these nonprofit entities that are now humongous with boards and people of stature who are making decisions on used clothing that have been donated. And much of this clothing is shipped overseas where they pay again or put on internet in auction sites. Yeah, you can bid on this stuff now. Woo woo, what about those who can't afford underwear 
and dainties and necessities and shoes. And co I mean, really, w what about them? Everybody is not milking the system. There are people out here today who are genuinely struggling. And for the record, somebody may not have told you this, but I just did. All you got to do is do the math, like I said. In the good old days when I was in banking, 25% of your income was to be allocated for housing. That's everything, everything. Your rent, your electricity, your water, 25% max. Today, like I said, 50% of your income is going, after tax, is going to just housing, not electricity, not water, just housing. And then don't have children, oh my words. Childcare, right, you can't take them to work. I mean, you can take your dog to work, but you can't take your children. That's something to think about, okay? Employers, you let them bring their dog, but they can't bring their children. And children are expensive. Daycare is expensive. Driving them to daycare is expensive. Having a, a humpty car or hoopty car is expensive. And the poor have no money. Period. Zero. 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 So, we've covered the clothing, which is deplorable, but is available. Okay? Uh, although revenues at many of the big box stores that specialize in lower brands are being compromised because even poor people can't afford to spend money like that anymore. And they're pulling back. They are pulling back. And which means that they don't have the money. Okay? They don't have the money. Walmart and Target are not cutting it when you have no money. Okay, so I'm just trying to make you aware because when you look at your circumstances, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent, just be aware that not everybody has it good right now in the United States of America. We're beginning to model the other countries in terms of our people and our lifestyles, although nothing is to compare with three million Ukrainians having to flee with the clothes on their back and babies. And that, 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 that's, just, that's just awful. But I may say that is all a part of wartime. People do go through horrible things in war. And I guess I'm not a war lover because I think it's just worthless. I, I can't see the benefit of it. I can't, other than somebody's ego just going through the roof, really. And I'm saying this because we've been through World War I, World War II, we've been through the Korean War, we've been through Afghanistan, uh, and now we're dealing with war in the United States because all of the cell groups that are blowing up are blowing up over here. And, and we know it, and the FBI knows it too. And, you know, these crazies are running around everywhere looking like us. Sorry, they're not immigrants. They're U.S. citizens, okay, doing crazy things. But I don't want to get into that. I want to talk about the third area about um, in the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which has to deal with food. And like I started off, if you don't have food, everything changes. Everything changes. Okay, you can squeeze in a car, you can wear some funny clothing, but if your stomach is growling and hungry and the children are crying, that is an experience that has no definition. So when I was informed that the United States government was not extending the provisions for food stamps, uh, that they had during the pandemic, that all expires March 1st, I believe, and that there were going to be an excess of, I don't know, 91 million people that were going to find their stamps cut significantly. The question that entered my mind was, are we there yet? Because the world is currently in a food famine. Thanks to the ongoing war with Ukraine, many, many nations, many, Africa, Arab nations, 
over here. They don't have the grain supply that was essential for them to be able to cook, fix rice, and fix bread. Yes, bread is a staple in most of the world. People eat bread. Even in the Bible, people eat bread. Okay, they eat bread. It comes from grains which are grown in these countries. And now they don't have that or the grain price is so expensive they can't afford it. And for the record, we're not exempt. Why do you think chickens and eggs are so expensive? It's more than the, the, the avian flu, which chickens get. It has to deal with the cost of feeding the chicken because it's a living, living entity and it has to eat feed and feed derives from grain and primary source for grain is Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, so feed prices are off the chart and people can't afford to feed their chickens. And there's only so many chickens that you can turn into fried chicken, okay, before prices begin to reflect. And chicken eggs are expensive. Even in the, I mean, I buy my chicken eggs for the record from farmers. I do, why? Because I don't like middle people. Secondly, because I like fresh eggs. I'm from Kentucky. I don't like anything looking real weird. I want to know that the egg came from that chicken, okay? And not artificial intelligence or not a make-believe chicken, but a real live chicken. And that's a female, by the way, because males cannot have eggs. So I, I look forward to my chickens, a real chicken. The yolk is a deep orange. It looks happy. It looks healthy. Okay, that's the way I like my chickens. I, and, and, the, and the eggs, I, same thing. The Amish got it right. But having said all that, the majority of people do not do what I do. They go to the grocery store and that's where they come into shock awareness, which is, oh, oh, oh no, you have got to be kidding me. And so they look for cheaper eggs. And I must tell all of you here right now at the risk of offending our big box stores, when you buy a chicken egg in one of those stores, I'm not going to name the names because you're not going to sue me, but you know who you are. We don't know how long those chicken eggs have been in the warehouse, we do not know the chicken that laid the egg, if the chicken was a abused chicken, and just, you know, chickens lay eggs every day, every day. And the happy chickens have big fat eggs, and the sick chickens have scroungy eggs. And which type of chicken do you think is in your grocery cart when you buy chickens? Now there's some good companies that these big box companies sell, but again, the reality is that those chickens and those eggs have been out here a long time. So I'm giving you a sidebar because for those of you that are like, why are the chicken eggs so expensive? Well, the chicken eggs are expensive because the, the price to feed them, you know, they gotta eat, and uh, the price has just gone through the roof, and farmers are not the benefactors of the high prices. Farmers are trying to keep their heads above water right now and pay um, top dollar for grains to feed their chickens. In fact, one of the farmers that I bought my chicken eggs from, he's out the chicken business altogether. And I'm just like, what? And he's like, oh, it's just, it's just too expensive. It's just too expensive, okay? It's just too expensive. Clothing, well, they don't need clothing because they're covered with feathers, but they do need a place to live. They're in a coop, and they do need feed to eat, and that's expensive, okay? And then you do have to clean up after them all the time. So you have to be actively engaged in, in the chicken industry. So you do understand why the big chicken companies, they don't care nothing about a chicken. They throw them out there and they hope for the best and take the eggs and when they get tired of the eggs, they take the chicken. And what a miserable life for a chicken. Ah, my God, miserable. So, but back to this famine here and the cut back in the snap which is a special uh, enhancement on food stamps to enable 
uh, low income and poor people to have food. Now, how does it benefit them? Well, it keeps them fed uh, and um, it also keeps the Department of Agriculture in business because it's through that conduit that farmers sell their produce and then they are then sold uh, to stores and then stores accept the SNAP card. Well, all that's changing. And I'm here to tell you that the impact of that for all you smarty pant economists, smarty pant economists, policy makers, and elected officials, do you have any idea what the impact of people starving in America on a large basis is going to look like? Do, do you? And I, I understand the politics. Poor people don't vote. Why? Because they don't think they benefit. Are they right? I don't know. It must be some truth because it's hard as heck to get them to vote. Okay? It's hard as heck to get seniors in many cases to vote for the same reason. Why should I? Nobody cares about me. Well, with that kind of legislation in motion as we speak, I don't know what you call that other than I'm here to tell you right now on this particular episode of The Power of Money with Michelle Graves that the food famine is not coming, the food famine is here. I share with you 2023 was going to be an incredible year. An incredible year. Everything is pointing to, oh no. Now, I'm going to share with you something. What do you think is gonna happen when people are eating ramen noodles all day and their children and that they don't have money to take care of even the basic necessities. What, what, uh, uh, what do you think as a nation we're thinking? Because clearly you're not. And I know what you're gonna say. This was, this was only for the pandemic. And this was just to help people get through. Well, I'm gonna tell you something. We are still in a pandemic, okay? But it's beyond disease, all oh, my words. It's deeper than COVID, okay? The pandemic we face in this country is greed. Yeah, which is, I want it all, and you get none, and I want it all and you get none. And that's gonna wind up blowing up everybody because whether you like it or not, and I believe this, and I've got plenty of people that will support me on that, how a country treats its less capable people speaks loudly on the integrity and character and ethics of that country. Yes, it does. People that leave people starving and pressed in a country that is flourishing and bountiful with billionaires, billionaires who make more than the entire population of the poor, well that, and don't get, don't get it twisted, please. I'm not against billionaires. Pay your taxes, billionaires, and do what you're supposed to do, okay? Take care of the widow, take care of the homeless, take care of the poor. You certainly got enough money to do it. And you still got enough money for your kids, your grandkids, legacies, foundations, everything else. But there's an ethical issue here. And that's what I'm talking about. Why should people be starving? And why would you put, put our country in a position where we are now going to experience what other countries that have food famines are experiencing, which is chaos, which is rioting, which is confusion, which is people doing a little bit of everything. Now, case study. This actually happened in Detroit. Michigan, Motor City, big boys, cars, boom, 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 Motown. When Detroit had its economic come to Jesus moment, 
and the big companies started shuttering and closing down and there were thousands of families that had no money and literally roamed the streets of Detroit at night. How do I know? Because ladies and gentlemen, I was there on a missionary uh, activity and I'm going to tell you, there were parts of Detroit, Highland Park, that had roaming families, roaming communities of people that had no place to live and no food to eat. Hear me. This is real. I'm not making it up. I'm telling you what I saw and what I experienced. I had to go out at night feeding people cereal and milk and food. They had nothing. The middle class became the homeless. The automobile assembly line worker became a homeless man and, ch and children and wife roaming the streets with the big tin containers with heat to stay warm. Detroit is very cold, folks. The hawk is not kidding in Detroit, Michigan. And I'm going to tell you, the chaos that happened behind that situation, garbage collection ceased. Why do you think the truck garbage dumpsters stopped coming? Because they were being mugged. They were being robbed. Why would you mug a dumpster? Because inside of a dumpster is food. Yeah, food. And it blew me away. Because I'm just a Kentucky rural girl. What do I know about people eating in dumpsters? People eat where there's food, folks. And little people, children, can scurry real fast and pick real fast and get food for the family. Okay? I saw that with my own eyes. Not one time, but all the time. I saw families robbing other people that had homes and breaking in and taking food, okay? They, the police weren't coming. Why would a policeman show up there if he valued his life? And please don't quote me, but their responsibility, that's their job. Nobody is gonna die for the sake of enforcing the law with people that are hungry. They just hope that nobody gets hurt because the ambulances aren't coming. No, no. The fire truck is not coming. No, no. I'm painting a picture here so that you can understand why one little act, and it's not a little act, it's a big act with big consequences, real big consequences on our population. And it's been repeated all over the world, Venezuela and other, when people don't have food and they don't have access to food, they will become really, really uncivilized, and they will become difficult people to deal with. They will. Food will do that for you. This is why in the scriptures, Jesus was always feeding people. I'm like, why is he always feeding people? Because hunger and a growling stomach makes everything impossible. You talk about mental shutdown. I'm, uh, hey, Animals with two legs and a set of teeth and hands, uh, they're going to get food. And it may come at your expense or may come at someone else's expense. But I am saying predictably that because our country has such a history of wanting to experience before we make change, I'm telling you that this is getting ready to be an experience. And Change will have to come, and I'm not sure how it will come, but I'm saying to you, a warning, warning, change is coming. Food famine in other countries, Kenya, Pakistan, Peru, Indonesia. I could go on and on and on and on and on about food famine. Other countries have already experienced it, are experiencing it right now. As we speak, speak, the political apparatus is going to blow up. Why? Because when you're in your safe little home 
And these people are all tearing up everything, trying to get food and protesting. You're next. You're next. There's no safety and there's no safety net. That was the purpose of that program, was a safety net. Same thing with stimulus. I, I, I'm amazed. I mean it. Who are you paying to do your economic analysis, sir or madam? Because when you sent the stimulus money out, the only people that should have gotten any stimulus money were the poor and the low income. Why? Because under, law, under the laws of capitalism, they spend the money immediately for necessities. And that money goes into the economy immediately and begins to spin the wheels. A fact, a fact. If you think I'm kidding, look at all of the low income catering organizations that sell furniture, cars, tax time, come in and get your car, show us your return, we'll get you that little humpty, hoopty, something, and get you going. They recognize that those people spend that money immediately. So why would you give money to the rich when they already got money? Or why would you give money to the middle income so they, they can simply bank the money? Why not give it to the people that could be impacted immediately? Now, I happen to know that I'm sure there was a bunch of controversy, and I applaud the president for doing something. I really do. But as a result of him doing something, there's a ton of money in the economy which is pushing inflation. It is. It's an economic truth. Pushing inflation because the poor have already spent their money. They did that immediately. Oh my goodness, I got to check. I got to spend it. But because everybody else lagged because they didn't have to spend it, put pressure, pressure on demand because people had money and they could not meet supply. Perfect, perfect equation for inflation. Talked to you all about that in previous shows. A year or so ago, I said, it's coming, it's coming. And you're going to know when you go to the meat market and meat has doubled in price and you can't afford meat. Oh, my goodness gracious. You can't afford a steak. What's the world coming to? And you can't afford your staples because of the push of all the money in the economy. That's what the Fed is trying to do. They're trying to create balance so that inflation can be brought under control. And am I optimistic? No, I'm not. I'm not optimistic at all. Why? Because what's pulling and pushing inflation now is more than just too much money. It's a lot more going on out here today. A whole lot more going on. We got the debt. We got Social Security. Oh yeah, my, my group's got to get, get taken care of because we paid into the system we paid into the system, folks, okay? You got Medicare, which is health care for seniors, paid into the system on your paycheck, and then you've got military. The defense budget's 18%. Well, you gotta protect everybody. So what's left are all these little nitpicky things. And oh, least I not forget, the debt. The debt, which is money we had to borrow to keep this machine going and money that we have to pay interest on to keep this machine going. And you get the picture. There's not a whole lot of room for Fritz fratting and trying to negotiate because the big boys are gonna be there. Seniors are not gonna give up Medicare. Are you kidding me? They depend on it to live. They don't have pensions anymore. No, they don't. They have 401ks, which are just like playing Ponzi's or dice, but their core is still Social Security. Medicare, they paid into it. It's theirs for their health care. When you get older, body parts start wearing out, and it's not like you can replace some of them. Some of them you have to fix and everything. And of course, like I said, you got all that going, and then you got the military. 
and personally, we better have the military, <laughs> oh my God, and their families. Why? Because that group is committed to upholding the Constitution, being men and women of great honor and service, and protecting us from enemies because, frankly, a whole bunch of the world doesn't like us. So you need protection. And you need all that goes along with the mil military, which are your aircraft, your bombs, all that stuff which is a part of the military spending. Okay, so I'm saying all that because when we talk about food famine and what is now on our trajectory that was created legislatively and now it's being eliminated, well, I, I don't know what to say. In France, history says that, who is it? The lady that got the guillotine, let them eat cake, which is bread. And they were like, oh, really? Because, like it or not, the numbers of the poor are vastly greater than the numbers of the rich. And you can go to an island all by yourself if you want. And I hope the best. I hope the sharks don't eat you for dinner. But the reality is that without understanding the impact of what this can mean, people can do these things without thought of outcomes and consequences for having done them. And I'm speaking about it today because, again, the three things I'm concerned about as we move forward in 2023, the year that nobody can or will forget, because it's the beginning, is housing, which I've already told you about, clothing, which you already know is not the issue, although clothing that's used should be free. I believe, I just believe that. I believe it needs to be an effort by churches and just give people what they need, okay? I, I'll sign up, I got way too much stuff, way, way too much stuff, and it's okay because if I can help your day to be a warmer day, I'm game for that, for real. That is not the issue, and then we have food. Food, clothing, shelter, but the most important is food. And now you're facing the loss of monies as a result of the elimination of the special provisions under the um, food stamp program that is designed to help low-income people to eat. Now, you can think whatever you want, and please don't start talking to me about, they need to get a job, they need to get a job. You need to get a life. <laughs> you need to be grateful to have a job. You need to be grateful that your employer writes you a check. You need to be thankful that you're not furloughed because that's all in motion right now as a result of inflation. You need to be thankful that you have children that hopefully love you and will tend to you as you get older. You don't need to be talking about people having a job. I truly, truly believe that most able-bodied people, and maybe I'm just, you know, little Mary Sunshine, I don't think so. I really do think that most men would want to work, okay? Even if it's just sweeping streets. People were designed to work. Men especially were designed to work. A man that does not work has got to have mental challenges or something else or disabled and can't work. But the DNA of a male is to work. So when you throw out that, well, he, he's lazy, he doesn't work, then, you know, he's going to starve. But that is not the case with so many people. They're working poor people. They work every day, 
husband works, wife works. She is a, she's a single mom. She's humping two jobs in most cases with the oldest child babysitting the other ones. Well, why do they have babies? Well, excuse me. Excuse me? Why do they have babies? Why do you have babies? For the same reason. Two people get together and voila, here comes baby. Okay, well they need to do better. Well, okay, then how are they gonna do better when the laws that are on the books now really are not, <laughs> I won't even talk about Roe versus Ray, Wade, I, I won't even go there. Okay, I won't even go there because that's just too painful. But before pointing a finger and saying what they should do, may I suggest to you that there are some things you could do. And one of the things that you could do is you could call your congressman or congresswoman, call them and tell them, I, I don't like that legislation. I think that we, we should take care of poor people and make sure they have enough to eat. Can we do that? Can somebody rewrite that legislation? Can somebody extend the timeline because of the economy and what is going down the track? I mean, you don't have to be a, a crystal ball reader to know that things are not good, that people are sick from all the bad medicine and the lifestyle that people are challenged because they can't get stable jobs, even though the job market they say is booming. And I'm like, but it's booming in areas that nobody has any skill sets. <laughs> okay? They don't know how to apply and get the job. And then because they've been rejected so much, they've got fear. They're scared of not even being considered. So they won't even go. So what do they need? They need job advocates to help them so that they can get them in jobs and get them on the right track. I mean, that's, that, that's what everybody else does in other countries. They recognize you have to coach some people and that's okay. How do you help women with children? Well, you start with decent housing, food availability, and training her so that she can get the skill set to go into the marketplace because the children are going to get bigger. These are practical, sensible things you can do. I don't know why it takes a billion people to try to come up with strategies. It's really about looking at how things impact on our society. It's not about, oh, they're just poor. Well, that affects us, okay? It brings me no pleasure to see a woman in a grocery store struggling with trying to figure out how to pay this bill with children in tow. She doesn't have enough money on her card and the children are pulling on her. And that's real life. And then she has to go to work because those are the rules. There's something wrong with that equation. That's all I'm suggesting to all of you. To think about it. Be aware, but please, my God, be awake. Be awake and see what it is for what it is, okay? And there should be a little bit of empathy in your heart to see the necessity of doing something, okay? Our seniors do not deserve to eat cat food, although cat food and pet food is expensive. So let me change that conversation. They don't need to be eating ramen noodles, okay? They don't need to be eating stuff like that or filling up on soda pop so their stomachs won't hurt, period. They, they don't need to be living like that. And so if we're in a society where our seniors are being malnourished, our young people are being malnourished, then you're setting yourself up for a problem you really are. You're setting yourself up for a problem. It's gonna impact them for the rest of their lives. For people that have lived through the depression, I can tell you as an advisor, they never forgot the hunger. 
they never forgot the hunger. They could talk about all the great uh, New Deal programs and what uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt did, but they can never forget the hunger, which is their daddies could not get jobs, they didn't have enough food, they were splitting an apple. I remember a story my great-grandmother told me that uh, there was an apple tree in the neighborhood that was owned by a person the property was owned by a person that didn't live in the neighborhood. They were black people. The property was owned by a Caucasian gentleman. And they were hungry and the tree was ripening. And nobody was eating the apples and the apples were gonna rot so they thought. So they started picking the apples for their families to eat. And did not the police show up and arrest them for picking apples from that tree. Uh, is that insane? Is that insane to arrest a man or a woman for picking ripe apples from a tree to feed their family? That's what I'm talking about when I say that is insane. And where is the balance here? I said to her, what happened? And she said, to be honest with you, um, that policeman that did that could not come into that community after the tree incident without risking getting his tires slashed, getting uh, stuffed eggs thrown at him. They had plenty for eggs. And he was a miserable guy. And he said, but I was just doing my job. I was just doing my job. And he was. But his job required him to exercise insanity in motion. Leave those people alone. <laughs> Leave the people alone. Um, as a sidebar, I saw a family not too long ago uh, picking fruit off of a, a tree that was in a public area and they were busily climbing the tree and picking the fruit. And they looked like they were stressed. They looked like they were hungry. And I just said a little prayer as I drove by them, which was, please don't let the police show up and start arresting these people for picking fruit from this tree. Please don't let that happen, Lord. Please don't. And, um, and was in fast-moving traffic, or I probably would have even giving them some money. But my point being that the fact that people, I mean, this is America, my God. In Africa, which has plentiful food on roadways. I mean, everything grows over there. That's really where the great dirt is over there in West Africa. And people are always eating food off the trees. They aren't eating bread, but you know, the common people do eat fruit. And they eat things that are free and on government property. And that's how they get through it. And their government does not arrest them for eating fruit on government property. Isn't it something? Now, I don't know about private property. Because like I said, the situation that my great-grandmother told me about was private property owned by, she said, a white man in a black community. And he had a wonderful tree. So... I'm talking about the subject matter today, food famine in America. It's not just coming, but it's here. And some things you can do to make a change. Uh, again, I'm a strong proponent in taking advantage of the political apparatus and calling your elected officials and telling them on a federal level, this is federal, that you don't like this legislation and you're just putting your foot in it. The second thing you might want to consider doing is beginning to assist people, or if you're in a church or synagogue or whatever your faith system is, encouraging them to make uh, and expand food banks. A lot of them are pressed on food because the donations are down because of inflation and everything. But you be the change that you want to see. As Michael Jackson said, be the change. You be the change. But it starts with being aware, which is what 
I tried to do with you on this show today. And then being, voila, I'm awake. Oh, we, it could be me. Oh, we, it could be me. Closing out today's segment of The Power of Money, I thank you so much for listening in. I'm your host, Michelle Graves, affectionately known for, I don't know, 40 years now as the money lady. And I want to thank you. And also, I want to thank God for allowing me to not have a hungry belly. I'm grateful for that because it didn't have to be that way. You take care and have a great day. And God bless you as well. Bye-bye.